So 2 Corinthians chapter 12, and I'll look at the first 10 verses. And the title of the message this morning is Mighty in Weakness. Mighty in Weakness. And as I was preparing this message uh, for this morning, um, a memory came into my mind from eighth grade. It was my physical education class. And I remember there was a time when all of the coaches were, uh, they were testing the strength of all, of y- all the young men that were in my class. So the task we had, <coughs> excuse me, was to do as many pull-ups as we possibly could in one minute. So as you can imagine, um, I failed miserably at it. I completely missed the bar. Like I had to jump to grab the bar and I missed the bar, like I fell. And thank God for marching band because beyond eighth grade, I was able to opt out of PE for the rest of my K through 12 education. But all of the young men in our class, in our minds, we kind of already knew or we thought we knew who was going to do the most pull-ups. Well, it was the strongest guy in our class, the guy who played football, who was in all of the sports. But to our surprise, that guy had a very difficult time lifting his own body weight. So he actually didn't do as many pull-ups as we thought he would. It was actually the skinniest, shortest guy in our class that looked the weakest, which by the way, wasn't me, it was somebody else, um, even though I couldn't reach the bar. And he actually did, I think it was like 35 or 40, I can remember that. And um, we learned that day not to necessarily judge a book by its cover. Just because somebody or something seems or looks weak does not necessarily mean that he or she is not strong. And I think as believers, we know that when we face times of weakness, that's an opportunity to be the strongest because those are times when we can rely and depend on the Lord. Because the Lord allows circumstances to come into our lives that sometimes break us, they humble us, they cripple us to the point where all we can do is trust and rely on Him for strength. Now, one person that we read about in the Word of God, amongst many, um, is the Apostle Paul that can surely relate to this. I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul. This guy was truly a servant for the Lord. Um, he wasn't in it for any, any type of monetary gain. He wasn't in it uh, for any type of fame. He truly was serving the Lord because he loved the Lord. And he talks about beatings, imprisonments, the labors, the difficulties that he faced as he continued to serve the Lord faithfully. Now, the Apostle Paul, interestingly, he found in times of difficulty, those were also times of great joy because he knew that those times were only temporary and also those were times when the Lord was doing something good in his life. He was preparing him for something much greater, much better. And if you think about the Apostle Paul, his life or his walk rather with Christ and the end of his life, they both began and ended with peril. But the Apostle Paul loved the Lord and he loved the people that he served. So just a little bit of a background here. In the first letter to the Corinthians, which, by the way, um, our church went through um, a few months ago. So if you want to look at those studies, or those are archived on the website as well. But in the first letter to the Corinthians, Paul addresses some issues that were taking place there at the church in Corinth. And this was a church that he fathered back during his second missionary journey. And you can read more about that in Acts chapter 18. Now, he wrote the first letter to the Corinthians during his second missionary journey. And he wrote the letter from Ephesus, if you remember. And this was a church body that was full of carnal Christians. There were a lot of behavioral issues that Paul had to address here at Corinth. Um, They were questioning his apostleship. There was pride within the church body. There was um, sexual immorality taking place. There was division in the church, abuse of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, just to name a few things. And Paul wanted to address these things because he loved this church that he had fathered. He didn't just father this church and just leave them alone. He wanted them to finish their race well. And in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, the Word of God tells us that Titus had actually brought good news to the Apostle Paul. Um, He told him that the Corinthian church had received his first letter well and they they were remorseful for their behavior. Um, However, there were still some issues, particularly false teachers there amongst the group that were leading some of the Corinthians astray. 
and Paul wanted to address uh, these individuals. And what I love about this second letter is that we get a nice glimpse of the Apostle Paul's heart. And like I said before, the Apostle Paul, he loved the Lord, he loved serving the Lord, and he loved the people that he had the opportunity and the privilege to serve. And I think as believers, that should be our heart as well, to serve the Lord because we love him and the individuals, the people that we're able to serve and to lead to Christ, we should love them as well. And that should be our goal as believers. Now, once again, our focus here is on chapter 12 of the second letter to the Corinthians. And the first thing we're going to look at this morning is Paul's vision. Paul's vision, and this is the first six verses. So here the Apostle Paul, well actually before I get into this, let me open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this morning, this opportunity, Lord, to come here together and to hear from you. Lord, we pray that you would fill this place and fill us individually with the power and the person of your Holy Spirit. We pray that your word would pierce our hearts, Lord. It would change us. It would become flesh in our lives. We would leave different, Lord, from how we came in here this morning. We thank you so much, Lord God, for the privilege of knowing you. And Lord, I pray that I would decrease this morning, Lord, and that you would increase in me, Lord. And we're willing and we're ready to hear from you. We love you and we praise you. All these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. So in the first six verses of 2 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes, It is doubtless not profitable for me to boast. I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So notice here in the very first verse, it is necessary, though not profitable, for Paul to boast. You see, the Apostle Paul never wanted the attention to be on him. He always wanted the attention to be on the Lord. But he really needed the Corinthians to listen to what he needed to say. And in a sense, boasting was necessary. Because, like I said, there was an issue with some of the Corinthians, particularly the uh, false teachers that were leading some of these Corinthians astray. And some of these false teachers, these Judaizers, they often would boast about themselves and their so-called ministries. And in order for Paul to meet common ground with some of these Corinthians, in a sense, he had to boast. He had to show some pridefulness uh, to reach them. Nowadays, when you think about boastfulness and pridefulness, I mean, our society is full of that nowadays. People like to draw attention onto themselves. Sometimes they even lie about themselves to do that. They like to draw people onto them. Um, however, Paul wanted to draw people on to Jesus, not onto himself, like some of these false teachers. Now, when you think about this vision that is being spoken of here, um, it wasn't uncommon uh, for these visions, whether of angels, of Jesus, or of heaven, uh, to occur. And for example, I think about the transfiguration of Jesus that we read about in the Gospels. Um, Peter, James, and John speak of this. Um, also, Ananias, just another one to name a few. If you remember, Paul was blinded on his way to Damascus, and there we have the conversion of Paul. But Ananias, one of the Lord's servants, the Lord came to him in a vision and told him to meet Paul, to give him his vision back, and to lay hands on him. That way, um, Paul was that chosen vessel for the Lord's sake. So these were very, they weren't uncommon. They were common uh, to see these, these visions or these revelations of heaven, of Jesus, or of angels. But notice here in verse 2 and in verse 3, Paul continues, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, 
Whether in the body, I do not know, or whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. So notice here, Paul is referring to this unnamed Christian. And this event occurred 14 years ago. Now, it's suggested that Paul is speaking about himself here. Um, but he doesn't say it specifically. He uses a lot of um, third-person pronouns here in these first six verses, describing this person who has this revelation, he has this vision. Um, however, a little bit later, when we get into verse 7, there's a grammatical shift. We see him speaking in the first person about this individual that has this vision, and we can conclude that this person is actually Paul himself that he's talking about. But he doesn't say it quite yet. Now, some scholars suggest that Paul might be referring to a time when he was stoned in um, Lystra. Now, um, when I say stoned, I mean he was physically stoned with rocks. And if you remember, back in Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul and Barnabas were preaching. They were preaching the gospel. And then uh, Paul performs a miracle. The Lord uses Paul to heal a lame man. And remember, the crowd started, uh, they called Barnabas, I think they called him Zeus, and then they called Paul um, Hermes, I believe. And uh, they started to give sacrifices onto them. And, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas were like, no, it's not us, right? It's the Lord. And then some Jews from Antioch came along with the crowd, and um, they actually ended up stoning Paul. And some scholars suggest maybe Paul briefly died. And this is the vision that he's speaking of here. Um, we don't really don't know, because Paul doesn't say that specifically, but... This is what some scholars suggest, and I just wanted to share that with you. But what we do know is that Paul is speaking about an individual, and we'll see later that it's actually Paul. And this occurrence took place 14 years ago. And what I love about Paul here is that even though he's talking about having this wonderful, big experience with the Lord, he dares not bring the glory onto himself. And quite often, we like to bring the attention onto ourselves. I think we just live in a society where it's about bringing the glory onto you and not giving it where it's due. You know, often you run into people and they're so excited to tell you about maybe they got a new car, they got a new job, uh, they're doing this, they're doing that. Um, however, they forget to give the glory to God where it's due. It's not because of you, it's because of the Lord. He's the one who has blessed you with all these things. And Paul here, um, as we see, all the glory he wanted given to the Lord. We always want to take the background. We always want to be humble. The Lord loves humility. When we're humble and broken, that's when the Lord can use us the most. Now, Paul here, he doesn't know whether he was in the body or outside of his body. So he doesn't know if he was actually physically carried in his body to heaven or if it was his spirit separated from his body. He doesn't know this. He says it two times. He says it in verse 2 and also in verse 3. But notice he says that he was caught up into the third heaven. The third heaven. So what is he talking about here? Are there like different levels in heaven? Is it like, you know, like the Cielo Vista or the Selim Park Mall here in town, different levels? No, you see, Paul is using the language of his time here. Now, remember Paul, before his conversion, he studied extensively under Gamaliel, this Jewish scholar. Um, Acts chapter 5 talks about this. And they refer to the first heaven. Think about the atmosphere, that thin fluid that surrounds the entire earth. Um, so that's the first heaven. They refer to the second heaven as the starry sky, the planets. So think of like space where the, scar the stars and the planets are. And then the third heaven is where the Lord is, heaven itself where Jesus is right now, right? Because Jesus isn't on the earth. He is seated on the right hand of the Father right now, and we're, we're waiting anxiously for his return. Now, whether here, once again, it's talking about the third heaven, speaking of where God is, speaking of heaven. So this vision is of heaven where the Lord is, not the atmosphere or the plant, where the planets or where the stars are, where the Lord is. In, in verse 4, he says, how he was caught up into paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is awful for a man to utter. So once again, Paul was caught up into paradise, into heaven. And Paul mentions inexpressible words. 
uh, that are unlawful for a man to utter. So it's not, he, he won't repeat them back here on earth. And what's interesting about Paul's vision here, the description of his vision, is that he's very short about it. It's very abridged. It's very short. And he only talks about things that he heard and not things that he actually saw. So I was thinking about this and kind of comparing it to other uh, visions of heaven that we read about in Scripture. You know, Isaiah talks about one in um, Isaiah chapter 6. And of course, uh, John in the book of Revelation chapter 4 speak of um, experiences in heaven. And they talk about what they hear, what they see. And also, um, they're more descriptive, unlike Paul here, who's a little bit more reserved in describing what he saw there in heaven, or what he heard, rather, there in heaven. But when you think about that, even nowadays, uh, people will claim they've had visions or they've had experiences in heaven. Now, just because they're so willing to share it does not necessarily mean that it's not from the Lord or it did not happen. But as we hear people share these, these things with us, we do need to be cautious and, and test everything that we hear uh, with the Word of God. We want to be those Bereans. Uh, that way we're not led astray or confused with, with what the Word of God tells us. So moving on here in verse 5 and in verse 6, Paul continues and he says, Of such a one I will boast, yet of myself I will not boast, except in my infirmities. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool, for I will speak the truth. But I refrain, lest anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. So notice here in verse 5, this nameless man, this individual that he's talking about that had this vision, he really had something to boast about, right? He had this vision of heaven. However, Paul himself, he said, I'm not going to boast about those, type of, uh, those types of things. I'd rather boast about my infirmities. And if you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, the chapter before this one, in verses 23 through 30, there's a whole list of these things. You know, talk, Paul talks about the shipwrecks and the labors and um, the beatings and near-death experiences that he had, all for the Lord's sake. Paul would rather boast about those things than a vision of heaven. And then in verse 6, though he would desire to boast, he chooses not to do this. He doesn't want to be like those false teachers that are uh, corrupting some of the Corinthians there in the church of Corinth. He would rather boast about the difficulties. He didn't want to be foolish, just like those false teachers. He didn't want this experience to define him. He didn't want people to be drawn onto him just because of this experience. He wanted the focus to be on the Lord. And I think we can kind of relate to this. Maybe we all know someone who maybe has had X or Y experience, and that seems to be the only thing they ever talk about. Like you see them and they only talk about having this specific experience. And we want to be careful that we don't allow an experience in our life to define who we are, because who we are is defined in Jesus Christ. That is our purpose. That is our definition, not some experience like, I don't know, you met someone famous or you won the lottery or something. That, those things are all temporary. But who we are eternally is in Jesus Christ, and that should be what defines us, and that should be the focus. If we want to boast about anything, we should boast in the Lord. And I love what Jeremiah 9, 24 reminds us. It says, But let him who glories, the Lord speaking here, let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth. For in these I delight, says the Lord. So as I was studying this, um, this chapter here in 2 Corinthians, it reminded me of um, Psalm 73. And the last time I was up here, I actually shared with you all from Psalm 73. This was a Psalm of Asaph. And this was during a time of just great prosperity and unity in Israel, Psalm 73. And towards the end, unfortunately, of King Solomon's reign, he became very wicked and very oppressive and abusive of his power. Unfortunately, he became very obsessed with idolatry. And Asaph saw all of these things happening. He was becoming more powerless and more oppressed. And yet he saw the wicked around him prospering as what he thought were prospering. So in the psalm, in Psalm 73, if you, if you have time to read that later, 
Asaph actually starts boasting about the wicked and how they become richer and stronger and fatter and, you know, they start gaining and he's losing and he's oppressed. He doesn't boast about his difficulties like Paul does here. But then later in the psalm, Asaph quickly realizes that all of these people, these wicked people that seem to be prospering, were truly on slippery slopes, just like these false teachers here in Corinth. And just like Paul and Asaph, the quicker we realize um, that our self-worth is found in Jesus Christ, I think the quicker we are able to accept and understand that when we are at our weakest, that's when we are at our strongest, because that's when the Lord can use us the most. And people can see the Lord working through us the most during those times. So the second thing we're going to look at this morning as we move on here uh, to verse 7 is we're going to see Paul's difficulty. Paul shares a difficulty with us amongst all the others that he's already shared with us in Scripture. But if you look at verse 7, Paul writes, Unless I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. So notice here we have that shift in um, the grammatical uh, pronouns, right? Now we're using, he's using first person pronouns. So here we can conclude that Paul is talking about himself and he has been talking about himself the entire time here. Now, Paul's vision, his revelation, you know, was this, it was so big, it was grandiose. It would be so easy for him to be exalted above measure, to be puffed up with pride and to draw people onto himself. And this would possibly cause others to glory in him and on glory in the Lord. And um, sometimes, unfortunately, that does happen in the church. You see a ministry suddenly becomes very fruitful, and suddenly the shift goes from being on the Lord to the person or the, the leaders of that church. And when we think that, you know, they're the ones that have made all of these things happen, but really it's the Lord who produced the fruit there. And the focus is put on the pastor, or it's put on the leadership, when it should always stay on the Lord. I heard it once say that we should never put our pastors on a pedestal, but we should put them on a prayer list so that they can be lifted up. And surely that's something uh, we want to do here. We don't ever want to put the focus on the leadership, anyone who's up here, because we're nothing. We're, we're vessels. We're bodies that the Lord is using. All the glory should go to Him because He's the one that produces the fruit. All we do is plant and water. He's the one that produces. He's the one that grows. Um, it's His church. It's not our church. It's no one's church. It's the Lord's church. Now, Paul says here that he was given a thorn in the flesh to prevent this from happening to him, to prevent him from being exalted above measure, to prevent him from becoming prideful and drawing other people onto himself. And I love what he says here. He says that the thorn was given to him. He doesn't say, like, I was inflicted with this thorn. He doesn't complain about it. It's almost like he received it as a blessing or as a gift. But... He also says here, notice, it was a messenger of Satan to buffet. Now, that word buffet means to, to beat or to punch. So he says, it was a messenger from Satan to beat or to punch me, if you, if you replace beat and punch with buffet there. Um, so perhaps Satan had a role in this. He had um, the opportunity to touch Paul's life. Of course, with God's um, permission, right? You think about Job. Right? The enemy touched his life, but the Lord knew. The Lord gave him permission to do this, and the Lord was still in complete control. But perhaps the enemy wanted to touch Paul's life. I mean, you think about the Apostle Paul. Yeah, this individual was facing difficulties, um, but he had very fruit, fruitful ministry. I mean, this, Lord, this, guy, this individual rather was leading people to the Lord. And the enemy never ever wants the focus to be on God. He always wants us to be independent of God. And sometimes when difficulties come into our lives, we, we don't allow them to draw us closer to the Lord. We allow them to draw us further away from the Lord. And that's where we have to be very careful. Now, I love what Alan Redpath says in his book, The Royal Route to Heaven. So this is a book that is based on uh, studies in First and Second Corinthians. Um, there he says, that Christian that is always happy seems to have it all together. I wish I was that person. They have no worries. They're always blessed. 
Often the man who is being most blessed of God is being most buffeted by the devil. And it's so true because when we are at our weakest, that's when we can be at our strongest because that's when the Lord can truly do what he desires to do through us because we're completely dependent on the Lord in those times. So notice here he talks about this thorn. So what is this thorn in his flesh? You know, is it just a little piece of wood in his finger? Is it something that just pricked his hand? Well, the word here, thorn, that is being used is actually the word stake. You think about a stake that you can actually impale someone. Um, think about like maybe even like a, a tent stake. Um, so we can conclude that it was probably some severe trial that Paul was dealing with here. And many suggest it was probably a bodily trial. Uh, Paul, um, his eyesight, it is suggested that it was deteriorating. If you look at Galatians chapter 6, ver verse 11, for example, uh, Paul writes there, See with what large letters I have written to you with my own hand. So that suggested that um, his poor eyesight was being translated into his actual writing. Uh, but we don't know specifically. Paul doesn't say specifically here. Uh, we can only deduce just based on what we see in Scripture. Um, in verse 8, Paul, regarding the thorn, he says, Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. Now, what I love about Paul is his reaction to the thorn. Um, you know, he doesn't complain. You think about society today. People are so quick to get onto Twitter, onto Facebook, onto Instagram, even on a Snapchat, and they like to complain about everything. Or they go into the streets and protest and make fools of themselves, right? Paul doesn't do any of those things. Of course, they didn't have Facebook in that back then, but if you think about it today, um, you know, we don't want to do that. What Paul does is he goes to the Lord, and he asks the Lord three times to take this thorn away from him. And as I was studying this verse, I actually read something very interesting um, by G. Campbell Morgan. And G. Campbell Morgan said, perhaps Paul might have been using a Hebrew figure of speech that actually means ceaselessly, continuously, or over and over again. So perhaps Paul asked over and over again for this thorn to be taken away from him. Or maybe he asked three times. We don't know. But what we do know is that he asked the Lord to take this away from him. And Paul's reaction here actually reminded me of Daniel. You think about Daniel, a man of prayer, um, a man with great integrity and character. Remember when Daniel, when they passed that decree in the land um, and they weren't, allo they weren't allowed to pray to the Lord. And what did Daniel do? Well, he prayed, right? Three times a day he prayed and he, he gave glory to the Lord. He gave thanks to the Lord. Um, also, I think about Jesus. Remember the night before he was crucified, there in the Garden of Gethsemane. Um, he didn't complain to his father, but he prayed to him, right? Three times he prayed that this would be taken away from him, this cup of wrath would be taken away from him. But then at the end, he says, not my will, but your will be done. So as far as Paul asking three times or asking continuously, um, we don't know, but he says three times here. So what we do know is that he asked the Lord to take this away from him. And sometimes as Christians, as believers, you know, we, we go through life and it's almost as if we're walking through, I don't know, a patch of rose bushes or even thorny weeds and there's thorns poking us left and right. You know, those thorns don't necessarily have to be some sort of bodily ailment or sickness. They could also be temptations or difficulties that we're struggling with. Um, it could be alcohol, it could be drugs, it could be um pornography it could be anything that's separate it could be fortnite i don't know if you're obsessed with video games or something it could be anything like that you know that separates us from the lord um sorry my nephew plays that all the time so <laughs> um but anything that separates us from the lord something that we focus on more than we do on the lord um or maybe it's something that you thought you had conquered but it's coming back into your life and it's starting to haunt you again all these little thorns right um, we have to use those thorns to draw us closer to God, not draw us further away from God. From God, And maybe you've asked the Lord to take those thorns away from you, and maybe he hasn't taken them away from you, and maybe there's times in your life where it, those thorns poke you more than they do in other times of your life. But regardless of these thorns, whatever they are, because we all have thorns, we're all going through something. We're all going through something right now. Um, 
it reminds me that we have to continuously depend on the Lord. And in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 7, and um, Pastor Angel just finished going through 1 Peter a few weeks ago, but here we're told to cast our cares onto the Lord because He cares for us. And when I think about that, I think about like basketball, for example. You can think about the ball as your anxiety, your worries, your cares. And every time the ball comes back to you, you have to pass it back to God. And then it comes back to you, keep passing it back to God because we cannot deal with those anxieties and worries because we're not God. Only God can take care of those things for us, those thorns in our life. And he can either remove them or he can strengthen us so that way we can bear those thorns and those difficulties. So in verse 9 and in verse 10, uh, God gives Paul an answer uh, to his request. You know, Paul asked him to take this thorn away three times. And here the, the Lord responds to Paul. So in verse 9, the Lord says to Paul, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. And then Paul says, Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities than in the power of Christ, so that the power of Christ, rather, is upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. So notice here, the Lord says, hey, you know, I'm not going to take this thorn away from you, but rather I'm going to give you something better, right? He tells him that his grace is sufficient for Paul. And that grace is made perfect in weakness as well as that strength. Now, God sometimes doesn't give us everything we ask for. I think we've all learned that, you know, everything we pray for, everything we ask for. Um, however, the Lord will always give us what we need to remain faithful to his purpose. And here for Paul, he didn't take the thorn away from him. So Paul took pleasure in his infirmities, it says here, his reproaches, his needs, his persecutions, his distresses. And he did this all for Christ's sake. And these things made him completely dependent on the Lord. And God's grace was enough for him. And when we are weak, we are strong. And when we are at our weakest, that's when the Lord can do amazing things through us. I like what William McDonald says about this. He says, successful service for Christ depends on a weak servant. The weaker he is, the more power of Christ accompanies his ministry. And when you think about God's grace, when I think about God's grace, it's having God's favor. It's always available to us and it's sufficient. It's enough for us. Um, and it's God's grace that has gotten us to where we are now and is going to get us to where we're going, wherever he has us going in the future. But I love Paul's reaction to all of this. You know, Paul doesn't get upset about it. Um, but rather he surrenders to the Lord's will and he agrees. In verse 10 he says, Therefore I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and needs and persecutions and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And unfortunately, we don't always react like Paul does when the Lord doesn't give us what we think is good for us or what we think we deserve, right? And the safest place to be is in God's perfect will. So whatever the Lord allows into our lives or he gives us as we pray, um, that's the best thing for us in Christ Jesus. And we need to put our complete reliance and our trust in the Lord, even in those times when we don't understand what he is doing. And I can tell you, this is something I greatly learned um, a few years ago. Um, I was actually, I was in graduate school. I was living in Colorado at the time. And I suddenly developed some severe symptoms of dizziness, headaches, um, a constant thirst, and times of confusion. And I remember I, I saw, I think it was around 10 doctors up in Colorado, and they couldn't help me. I think at one point, they, um, I, think, I, I think they thought I was crazy because they wanted to give me antidepressants. Um, I was working on a PhD at the time, so they thought I was depressed and anxious and overwhelmed, but that wasn't the case. Um, I ended up going to the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota, and they found that I had a small tumor um, 
in my pituitary gland um, towards the base of my brain. And then I had also perhaps suffered a mild traumatic brain injury, which is interesting because a few months later I was in a vehicle accident um, up in Colorado, but I don't remember necessarily hitting my head. Um, but for the next several months, I had to endure some very intense, it was, it was very hard. It was physical therapy, um, vision therapy, and some brain integration therapy. I mean, I was always dizzy. I couldn't even like walk into a store because I couldn't, I couldn't move around, I couldn't drive. It was, it was a very difficult time. Um, but interestingly, around that time, um, I was beginning to lead um, the college and the young adult ministry um, up at Calvary Chapel in Fort Collins. And I remember in that time, in order for me to do that, I needed to rely on the Lord. I needed to trust the Lord for his strength and for his, his guidance. And I know now, um, and it took me a while to realize that then, but that circumstance where I was completely floored, completely weak, um, was the circumstance, the thorn in my life, if you will, that was going to allow me to trust the Lord and to serve the Lord, even though I was physically uh, dizzy all the time and um, sometimes not very pleasant to be around. So I knew that um, that thorn uh, the Lord was using to make me better, to trust him, to rely on him. Because the truth of the matter is nobody could help me. The doctors couldn't help me. Um, peop nobody could make me feel better. Only the Lord could help me. And it's interesting because when I would teach the young adults, the dizziness would go away. When I would prepare, when I would pray, like it would go away. And I knew that was the Lord. And it, it was just one of those aha moments where you recognize what the Lord is able to do in your life. And I'm very grateful for that time. It was a very difficult season for me. Um, but in a sense, it was preparing me, not just for ministry there, uh, for ministry here as well, but also um, my mom, she suffered a brain hemorrhage uh, about a year and a half ago. And that's what brought me back to El Paso. Um, that, that, hap that event has brought me and my family together uh, to help with her recovery. And um, I can tell you, the way we trusted the Lord then is the same way we trust the Lord now, because the Lord doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The author of Hebrews tells us that. And it's so true because the Lord is there. He's, he's not going to change. The circumstances change. The difficulties change. But the Lord is the same. Now, in closing this morning, uh, there were several things that we looked at. The first thing we looked at, we talked a lot about, was Paul's humility. We talked about this vision that he had of heaven, this experience he had um, there in, in um, the kingdom of God. So even though Paul had this incredible vision, this incredible experience, he chose not to brag about it. Um, but he chose to brag about, to boast about the difficulties in his life. He wanted the focus to be on God and not on himself. And all of these false teachers that were there in uh, Corinth, they were leading people onto themselves. These were peddlers of God's word. They wanted financial gain and self-gain as well. So they weren't doing it for the Lord. They were doing it for themselves. And uh, Paul, in contrast, was doing it all for the Lord. The second thing we looked at was a thorn in uh, Paul's flesh. And we talked about the thorn. Uh, perhaps it was some sort of physical ailment. Uh, we don't know specifically here. However, we did talk about the many thorns that maybe we possess in our own lives that the Lord has allowed into our lives. Um, maybe it's a physical, sick, a physical ailment like a sickness. Maybe it's um, temptations, difficulties that we're facing. Maybe it's a hard season that we find ourselves in. Any of those things. And just like Paul, we need to rely on the Lord. You see, Paul asked the Lord to take that away from him three times, it says here in the Word of God. However, the Lord gave him something better. Right? He told him that his grace was sufficient for him and that it was made perfect in weakness. And when I think about this thorn in Paul's flesh, remember we talked about the word thorn, and you can think about it as a stake. You know, I think about Jesus and the cross and how he was nailed to the cross. He was literally pierced to the cross with these nails, these stakes, if you want to call them, and how his grace freely flowed from the cross and it's freely available to all of us. And that is where our strength com comes from. And that grace that we freely receive is a grace that has us where we are now and the grace that's going to continue to carry us wherever the Lord's taking us next. And sometimes we need these thorns to continue depending on the Lord. 
And in Proverbs 3, verses 5 through 6, the Word of God says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He shall direct your paths. And truly, the only way we can trust God is by having a relationship with God. And the only way, the only way we can have a relationship with God is by believing, putting our faith in His Son, Jesus. Believing that He died for your sins, believing that He was buried, and believing that He rose from the dead three days later. You put your faith in that message, you recognize you are a sinner, and you repent of your sin. That's what makes us righteous in the sight of God. That's how we can have a relationship with Him. In that way, God's grace can be sufficient for us as well. Um, Because without God, we truly are weak. But with God, we are strong and we are mighty. And nothing is impossible with God. Amen? Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word this morning. Lord, we pray that throughout the week that we just rely on you, Lord. And whatever thorns, whatever difficulties that you allow into our lives, that we allow them to make us better and not bitter, Lord God. We thank you so much for your love, for your blessings, and Lord, we just pray that you continue to shape us and to mold us into the likeness of your son Jesus every single day. We long to see you, Lord, face to face, and we pray, Lord God, that we are just powerful witnesses wherever we are. Our scope of influence in this community, help us to just be a blessing to everyone around us and give us discernment as well, Lord. We thank you so much for just the sacrifice of your son, Jesus. And we thank you so much for the hope and the future that we have in him. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.